Hello, this is Helen Morrison, and welcome to Speech Acoustics and the Audiogram. This lecture is the fifth and final lecture in the Speech Acoustics lecture series. We've talked about speech as complex sound. We've talked about phonation, vowels, and diphthongs, consonants, and now we're going to wrap it all up and talk about the audiogram. If you're interested in having a copy of these slides, you can go to the Dropbox link that is on this slide, or you can write to me at HelenMcMorrison at gmail.com, and you are welcome to write to me also with comments and questions. The topics in this lecture will begin with a review of the material that we've talked about up to this point, the frequency components of speech sounds and their acoustic cues. We'll then begin to build the audiogram, first on the frequency domain, because that's what we've been talking about up to this point. We'll then add the intensity domain and talk about the ways that speech acoustics in connected speech are conveyed on the audiogram form. And then I want to share some final thoughts for the application of speech acoustics in the educational and clinical context. Now, when we left one another with the consonant lectures, we had created a full chart of speech sound types and frequency ranges for the acoustic cues that go with speech sounds. Now one aspect of this chart that is important for us to keep in mind is that the frequencies that are listed here for the different speech sounds along the frequencies 250 through 8000 hertz, these free frequency designations are within plus or minus one half octave, meaning that the actual frequency and also intensity of speech varies with the gender of the speaker, the age of the speaker, it also varies with regard to the surrounding context of a speech sound. So a consonant in different vowel consonant in different vowel contexts is going to have some slightly different characteristics depending upon which vowel preceded it, which vowel came after, and these sounds all overlap with one another and influence one another. Likewise, a vowel is affected by the consonant that proceeds it, precedes it, and the consonant that follows it. So we need something to hang on to. But in real life, no one speech sound is going to ever be a particular frequency every single time you hear it. Let's give ourselves a little bit more specific review on what we've talked about up to this point. We talked about the fact that the supersegmentals of speech, by this I mean um, cues for duration, intonational contour, syllable number, stress. Um, if we looked at this frequency range, 250 to 8000 hertz, those primary cues are at around 250 hertz. You're going to see me expand that a little bit as we go on in this lecture. Vowels are cued by jaw movement, the F, the first form in F1, by tongue bunching, F2, F1 appears at 250 and 500 hertz, through 500 hertz, F2, 1000 through 2000 hertz. Liquids and glides are slowly changing formants. Liquids and glides are voiced, so voicing at 250 hertz. The F1 for liquids and glides for jaw movement is generally around 500 hertz. F2 around 1000 hertz. And then for the sounds ra and la, 
The third format, F3, is important for differentiating these two sounds that are produced by differentiation of tongue, move, tongue tip movement and tongue tip position, and that's around 2,000 hertz. Nasals are characterized by the nasal murmur that characterizes the manner of articulation and voicing as well as the nasal murmur that nasal resonance is around 250 hertz. Place of articulation for nasals is around is the F2 transition around a thousand hertz and nasals are characterized by very little high frequency energy. Plosives have a variety of cues that cue for the voice-voiceless contrast, for the manner of articulation, which is what a plosive is, and also for place of articulation, labial, alveolar, velar, for example. So voicing, we talked about the fact that voicing is cued by timing characteristics of the plosive. But if we just look at frequency characteristics, the voice voiceless contrast is cued in 250 hertz. The noise burst that characterizes a plosive ranges, depending upon the plosive, from 500 hertz through 4000 hertz. The second format transition from consonant into vowel and also a bit of vowel into consonant um, ranges in general at 1,000 to 2,000 hertz. Fricatives, voiced fricatives, the voicing component is around 250 hertz. Fricatives are characterized in terms of manner of articulation by turbulence by a noisiness, a continuous sound that's turbulent. And we talked about the fact that there's a primary band of energy in that turbulence that varies with place of constriction to create that turbulence so that the farthest back in the mouth that is the constriction for the H or the H, the primary turbulence is at 1,000 hertz and increases in frequency as the place of constriction moves more forward in the mouth. And there is some general turbulence that exists even up through 8,000 hertz. And then finally, the affricates, which are the combination of the plosive and the fricative. The voice cognate of the affricates is, has voicing characteristics around 250 hertz. But we must also note that there's also some timing aspects that aren't listed here. The noise burst in the affricate for the plosive component of that manner of articulation. The noise burst ranges from about 2,000 through 4,000 hertz. And the turbulent characteristic from about 2,000 to 8,000 hertz. Now, Let's switch perspectives. And you're going to hear me say a lot of the same information over and over and over again in different ways. I'm doing this with a purpose so that you can hear the information in different ways. One way may help you understand the information a little bit better. And also, I think that eventually you'll start to second guess me and hopefully be able to say to yourself, oh, I know what she's going to say because I know this information so well. But let's think about the audiogram. The audiogram is laid out in two domains. Frequency, where my cursor is circling up here at the top of the audiogram, laid out generally from 125 to 8,000 hertz on most audiograms. And these are the primary octave intervals from 125 to 8,000 hertz. And then on the intensity domain, we start at the top of the page with the softest intensities and intensity of the signal as the intensity of the signal increases in order to obtain a, a threshold 
we move down on the page. And you'll see on this particular audiogram, the person who created the audiogram has indicated where the different degrees of hearing loss might be if we were to plot audiometric th thresholds on this form. So let's take the information that we had where we were organizing the information by speech sound type and now let's organize it by frequency. Let's shift a little bit. So we're adding some frequencies to what we've considered. We're adding 125 Hertz. That wasn't on our tables in the past. We're adding 3000 Hertz and we're adding 8,000 Hertz. We're also going to add a little bit more information to be more consistent with some of the literature that's out there, at least with regard to children with hearing loss. So here's the exact same information that was on the table that you're familiar with that we just went through. Now that information has been shifted so that we're looking at the same information by frequency at the top of the page rather than on the side of the page and speech sound type on the side of the page. Let's walk through it and let's walk through it asking ourselves if I can hear through a particular frequency what can I hear? Because that's really the application of speech acoustics to the audiogram. So, if a listener can hear through 250 hertz, that listener can hear super segmentals. The fact that vowels and diphthongs are voiced, they can hear when consonants are voiced and therefore can make the voice voiceless distinction between consonants. They can either hear the voice on or off, and the listener can also hear nasal murmur. If we add hearing so that the listener can hear 500 hertz, the listener adds a little bit more intonational contour, which is new information that I just wanted to put out there, um, that there are some there are some charts that you see in literature regarding speech acoustics in children with hearing loss that if you hear through 500 hertz, that's what's important for hearing intonational contour. The speech science literature doesn't really go in that direction. So to resolve that difference, I do want to point out that children's fundamental frequency is around 315 hertz. So as that fundamental frequency shifts in the intonational contour, if you don't hear past 250, if a child doesn't hear beyond 250 hertz, they're going to have a little trouble with intonational contour. In addition, there's evidence that infant-directed speech or motherese can, can actually range all the way up close to the 400 hertz region. So we're going to say that full solid perception of the intonational contour is best when the listener can hear through 500 hertz. If you can hear through 500 hertz, you can hear also vowel F1 and the F1 for liquids and glides, and you can start to get some plosive information, manner of articulation through the noise, with regard to the noise burst. So you can hear intonational contour, if something is a vowel, if something is a nasal consonant, and if something is a plosive consonant. So you've got some pretty nice information there if you can only hear through 500 hertz. And to revisit something I said in our very first lecture, a child who's a candidate for a cochlear implant still has very likely some audition through which those neural pathways can begin to be developed. So we want to continue to stimulate and to direct to listen and to encourage learning 
through the auditory function, through whatever the child can do to get those neural pathways developed. And we've got a little bit of information there that the child can learn from. If you can hear through a thousand hertz, you can start to hear F2. The F2 in back vowels and liquids and glides, the F2 transition, implosives, and you can start to hear the lowest frequency range of turbulence and fricatives, which would be the primary frequency range for the fricative If we add 2000 hertz, we gain even more F2 information. You add that F3 information for the R and L. You add more turbulence and fricatives, and now with F2, the listener can begin to hear noise burst and turbulence in some affricates. And then the information becomes more rich as we add F3. Now I want to point something out. I'm sorry, be, the information becomes more rich as we add 3000 hertz. And I want to point something out. Notice here that I say 3000 hertz is a frequency range for F2 for some front vowels. And in some literature, you will see that F2 full vowel discrimination, including full discrimination and full identification of F2, requires hearing through 3000 hertz. And that's certainly true for children's voices and front vowels. So 3000 hertz is um, really golden for full vowel identification. It's not impossible through 2000 hertz, but it's much easier through 3000 hertz. We likewise get more F3 information at 3000 hertz, and we're just getting more rich information with regard to noise bursts and turbulence in the plosives, fricatives, and affricates. 4000 hertz is the frequency region that where there's information with regard to plosive and affricate noise burst and turbulence in fricatives and affricates. And 6000 hertz gives us even more turbulence information and then we round it out with 8,000 hertz. But let's simplify this. And rather than talking about each of these different kinds of speech sounds, let's talk about general features. I'm just going to try to make it simpler now that we've heard it in more detail. So the first thing I'm going to do is to start drawing some arrows where in, few, in past... Um, graphs. Let me go back up here where I've I've typed in nasal murmur, nasal murmur, F2 transition, F2 transition, noise burst, noise burst, noise burst. Instead, I'm going to draw some arrows just to make this a little bit less busy. So nasal murmur goes from 250 down to 250, 125 hertz. Constant voicing, 250 down to 125 hertz. Some of you may prefer the arrows. Some of you may prefer the writing. It's your preference as a learner. I wanted you to have both kinds of display to think about and to study from. But I'm going to use this kind of display when I try to simplify how we're thinking about speech features, and the audiogram. So let's ask the question again. If one can hear through 5,000, through 500 hertz, one can hear super segmentals, vowel and diphthong voicing and consonant voicing. Also, if one can hear through 500 hertz, one can hear F1, which means at jaw height. What about consonant manner? Consonant manner ranges, the cues for consonant manner, really range from 125 all the way through 8,000 hertz. 
Ling, in his 2002 second edition of Speech in the Hearing Impaired Child, listed 500 hertz as containing primary information for constant manner. So what he was saying is that if, if the listener can hear through 500 hertz, they can hear some important and primary cues for constant manner. And by that, what I interpret that to mean is if you can hear 125, 250, 500 hertz, you can hear the, the slowly changing F1 that is associated with liquids and glides. You can hear nasal murmur, and you can hear the noise burst of plosives. He said that there is secondary information at 1,000 hertz, so if we add 1,000 hertz, we get more liquid and glide information, and we add fricative turbulence and tertiary information for manner of constant production at 2,000 hertz, meaning, I believe, that you're now adding affricates. So I'm going to say, for simplification, if one hears through 500 hertz, one gets some really good consonant manner information. I'm also going to say that the majority of consonant manner information, meaning glide transition for um, formant transitions for glides, nasal murmur, noise burst for plosives and affricates, and turbulence for fricatives and affricates. Those manner cues for consonant manner of articulation are predominantly 500 through 2,000 hertz. So you can get pretty good manner of consonant production through 2,000 hertz. You can really get a good start if you can hear through 500 hertz. Now, consonants extend, though, however, into even higher frequency ranges. And that's where vowel and consonant place information are important. So if you remember our, our dimensions of consonant production, voice, manner, and place, when we think about consonant place, and I'm putting vowels in here too, which is essentially tongue movement, that's that F2 range. That's what happens with the tongue. So that information ranges from really about 1,000 through 6,000 hertz, where our primary place information lies. Ling, in his 2002 edition of Speech for the Hearing Impaired Child, said that the primary cues are at 2,000 hertz. So he was saying that if you can hear through 2,000 hertz, you can hear most of the F2 of both back and front vowels, even though it's a little bit into the 3,000 hertz range. You can hear F2 and F3 for liquids and glides. You can hear the F2 transition for nasals, which gives place of production for nasals, nasals, the difference between mm, mm, and mm. You can hear the F2 transition and the noise burst, which also gives some place information for plosives. And you can hear primary turbulence, at least for ha and sh and zh. And you can also begin to hear that noise burst for affricates. And the place of primary energy for these noise bursts in places of affricates does give some place information. Now, he also said that there are secondary cues at 4,000 hertz. And by this, he was saying that you can get even a more full um, information about place of articulation if you can hear through 4,000 hertz. Now, some historical comment here. The list of frequencies and frequency cues in Ling's 2002 book 
actually was originally found in his 1989 book. It's essentially un unchanged. And implanted hearing was not really part of the picture. And we know that children with cochlear implants can hear through 6,000 hertz. So we now find it important when we're looking at implant candidacy and what can be gained by the implant to ask ourselves, can the child hear with a hearing aid through 6,000 hertz? Because we know there's important information through 6,000 hertz with regard to place of consonant production. And we can now achieve that. And it's one of the reasons why a child might be an implant candidate if they lack that high frequency information or these days might be a candidate for a hybrid um, depending on the audiometric configuration. But to return to the topic at hand, vowel and consonant place information is between 1,000 and 6,000 hertz with the primary energies according to Ling's charts which can be important in terms of um, preparing for, say, Lissell's exams, the primary information at 2,000 hertz, secondary information at 4,000 hertz. So let's summarize that. Supersegmentals, constant voicing, jaw movement for vowels and glides, to hear that, if you can hear through 500 hertz, you can hear that. Cues for consonant manner exist from 125 throughout 8,000 hertz. If you can hear through 500 hertz, according to Ling, you've got some primary cues for consonant manner. If you can hear through 1,000 hertz, you have even more. And then your final touch for constant manner production being those tertiary cues at 2,000 hertz. Vowel and consonant place information signaled predominantly by F2 or the F2 transition from constant to vowel or the place of pri the frequency range of primary turbulence or the noise burst in the case of fricatives and plosives. Um, range from 1,000 to 6,000 hertz. Ling's primary energies for vowel and constant place, if you can hear through 2,000 hertz, you've got some good access to vowel and constant place. If you can hear through 4,000 hertz, you have almost all of it. And nowadays, I would say, because we can provide access through 6,000 hertz, that really it's essential to have access through 6,000 hertz if at all possible. So we've talked about frequency. 